So our next speaker uh, for 30 minutes is uh, my colleague, the founding director of the O'Neill Center, Michael Cox, who will talk to us about the churn, the paradox of progress. Michael. Before I get started, let me say that it's been mentioned several times that we wish that Jim were here teaching high school students, and I agree with that. But I want you to know that we do teach high school teachers as one of our programs here, Teaching Free Enterprise Economic, Teaching Free Enterprise in Texas. And that was uh, generously funded by a long-term friend of mine and friend of free markets, Dick Weekly from Houston, Weekly Homes, but also matched by the O'Neills. And so uh, it's important that we do this and we bring this free market economics to the students in Texas. In fact, it's mandated uh, by the state leg legislature that free market economics be taught in our high schools, and that's very good for the state. All right, does this go to black here? One of my students um, in my current PMBA class, professional MBA class, told me the other day that he was driving up from Houston late at night, well, actually about two in the morning, when he passed a convoy of trucks going by, all about the same uh, distance apart, close, all exactly alike, and he looked up and there was no driver in the trucks. So he parked beside of the road to see it, if it were real, and he sees it was, and these trucks just go by and he got stopped by the police for doing that, but he got what he wanted, which was this, the feeling of uh, future coming at us. So. Today, my talk is about just that, the churn, capitalism's paradox of progress. Budweiser recently teamed up with Otto, a self-driving truck company owned by Uber to deliver important cargo, 52,000 cans of beer in Denver. Uh, and that's all over Europe now. There are these kinds of driverless trucks, of course, coming into America. Robots expected to replace 1.7 million truck drivers. I looked this number up yesterday. The number is 1.723 million. Um, the 18-wheeler drivers that we have, tractor-trailer truck drivers that we have. And that's just for those kinds of drivers. With the driverless cars coming, of course, are already here. Up in Frisco, we have a, dri a driverless taxi service. In the crosshairs are the jobs of 198,000 taxi or limo drivers that we currently have in the economy, plus the part-time, sometimes maybe full-time, 750,000 Uber and Lyft drivers, all those short-distance light-haul trucks where, Uber, where FedEx and UPS and the courier systems bring us packages, 878,000 of those jobs. And that's just for the, um, those kinds of jobs. Now, you're used to going into McDonald's, opened up their first store 78 years ago in San Bernardino, California. You're used to going in there and seeing people, cash registered, cashiers behind the counter serving you food. And we have 3,589,000 cashiers all across America doing this, um, not just in McDonald's, but elsewhere. Um, I'm sorry, not, I'm, I've skipped on to, this is the grocery. Sorry, I'm, I, I jumped ahead. Used to seeing cash registers in grocery stores, but if you go into Amazon today, into Amazon Go, you walk in, scan your iPhone, pick up your stuff, and walk out, and there are no cash registers, no uh, cashiers for those jobs. And as I said, here's McDonald's. They're having 445,000 cashiers across the country, not just at McDonald's, but other places. But uh, recently, when driving back from our, comp our uh, getaway up in Possum Kingdom, stopped at a McDonald's, and we have a kiosk there where you don't have to deal with the ticket with the person up front, the cashier. So those jobs are also, some portion of them, about to disappear from the economy. And on and on and on, today, we see people afraid that robots are coming to destroy our jobs, and we're not ready for it. Things like playing even our music or putting on your lipstick or your, your makeup, 
or eventually coming to the factory to tell you to get out because you're not doing your job as well as a robot could. The fear of this is here, of course. Of course, there are certain jobs, such as the people, you know, the telemarketers, 99% of them, expected to lose their jobs to robocalls already happening. But even such things on down here as actors and actresses, 37% of the actors and actresses are going to lose their jobs, right? Does that sound silly to you? Well, I thought about that, and then I just realized, what well, are here the last movies I saw? Shrek, Frozen, Despicable Me, Beauty and the Beast, Moana. It's already happening with all those animated films. We need fewer actors and actresses. And of course, the jobs that are most automatable are the ones where you have re repetitive mental, repetitive physical things, and uh, some percentage of the jobs are 100% that way, other percentage of the jobs are less that way, but nearly all of them are that way to some degree. So people are, again, worrying if robots take our jobs, what are the humans going to do all day long? Well, this, this uh, conundrum of job destruction is by no means a new phenomenon. At one time, we traveled like this. We traveled across the country, across our cities in carriages, pulled by horses, and where the driver had a buggy whip, and across the country, we used stagecoaches, and across, uh, or to get the entire continent, we would get on a train. This was the most popular way of traveling coast to coast, intercontinentally at one time. Very dangerous, by the way. Um, and across the ocean, we had steamships. So in those times, there were hordes of carriage makers, blacksmiths, teamsters, railroad engineers and conductors, boiler makers, and so on. But then came the automobile. In 1912, this is the Ford Model T, the first one. And all, later came the interstate highway system. We have about 4 million miles of road uh, in America today. About 50,000 50, of those miles are interstate highways, which now have the tractor-trailer trucks, which are substitutes, of course, for the train that was once there. Um, and then came the airplane also, other means of travel. And away went the jobs of those blacksmiths, the buggy, buggy whip makers. And most of those railroad jobs are gone. At one time, one out of every 15 persons who had a job in America worked for the railroads. And that was 1920 when railroad employment peaked at 2,076,000. Today, it is, now this chart only goes through the year 2000. Today, there are 118,000 people who work for the railroads, uh, not 2.1 million. And of course, the boilermaker jobs, well, we might have a few of those in New York City's and old uh, hotels, which are still using steam through radiate, what are those, radi radiated heaters up, uh, to, to uh, heat the rooms in wintertime. Similarly, my mother was a switchboard operator back I'm not sure exactly when, but she told me about it, 40s, I guess. And there were 421,000 jobs for women, mostly women, here as switchboard operators in 1970. We're down to 6,300 in uh, 2017, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Those are jobs are all gone, plus the jobs of a lot of miners, typing pools, or secretaries, uh, people who are worked on the assembly line. If you look at this picture right here, you mainly only see people. And then, of course, over here, your elevator operators. Can you imagine that being your life go up or down all day long in an elevator? At least you had a job, people say. The real thing we've cut are those farming jobs. At its peak in 1910, 11 and a half million people worked on farms. Today, just 405,000. So that's over 11 million jobs gone. Before the refrigerator, this is the way we used to get ice, saw it out of lakes in the winter time, cart it off, put it, put it in ice houses and hope it will last to the depths of the summertime. I'm sure the price went up in the summer. And, uh, but then came the first refrigerator, which was manufactured out of an old, retrofitted an old ice box. Uh, and the jobs of those ice trade people went away. One of my favorite episodes of The Twilight Zone is the Brain Center at Whipple's. 
where uh, this computer, which is, this is 1964. So this was the mainframe with all the vacuum tubes before the 1971 invention of the microchip. But still even uh, Rod Serling saw the ominous change in the economy coming and wrote an episode about it where this computer comes in and of course after it comes in it costs the jobs of a lot of people so the foreman working there decides to get some sledgehammers and stuff to destroy it just like the fable, I, I think it's a fable but I just went back and looked at it, of Ned Ludd who supposedly with his friends went into the cotton packing, to the, uh, um, what do you call it, mechanized looms in 1810 in Britain and destroyed them because they cost the jobs of the hand weavers. And we call those people Luddites who destroy technologies to save jobs. But it happened and the computer came into society and then also came the internet. And there were many, many jobs killed by the internet or at least hurt badly. One of those being the newspaper business and newspaper advertising revenue just drops and you've seen that industry suffer a lot, a lot of newspapers shut down. Of course, also so the Sears catalog, catalog, this is the last Sears catalog, which was fall, let's see, when is it? Spring, summer, 93. And I have it in my, in my office, I got it off of eBay. And um, then that's pretty much gone. And when Sears closed that, 185,000 people were laid off in one fell swoop. Britannica, Encyclopedia Britannica tried to exist for a few years after the internet came out, but with Wikipedia and all those other things, they eventually couldn't and went bankrupt. Uh, I gave a speech recently in San Diego to a bunch of people who were pretty wealthy and they, were, they had a society called the, the Local Search uh, Society. And uh, I finally figured out where they got their wealth from. It was from Yellow Pages, which pretty much we don't use anymore. But at one time, they were made very wealthy off of you know, the fact that the, every year they'd come to you and say, give us the next 25 bucks or whatever, and we'll put your name in Yellow Pages. And that disappeared too. So there are many other things that disappeared, including even the jobs of a lot of meter readers because now it's connected to the internet. Like I said, in this picture, you'll see thousands and thousands, well, in our factories of employees, people assembling cars. This is a Ford flywheel assembly plant uh, up in Detroit, but those people are no longer there. Instead, we had robots that do the job, and their people are, are few and far between. They'll probably be programming the robots or something like that. Lucy and Ethel really never did pack candy in a factory except on this famous and, and really funny episode of I Love Lucy where the, the line just keeps getting faster and faster and faster and they keep, can't keep up. But these machines really do pack candy today and you can see there's many, many different versions of this. The ones that pack candy just like that, chocolate in boxes perfectly. This particular machine is one of the newest ones and it picks up these candy canes, but before it picks them up, in fact, it's moving so fast, you can't see the arm right here picking this up and, candy, and putting it in a box. But before it picks them up, it, it has a laser which scans them and if it's, if it's broken or if there's anything wrong with the curve on the top of the candy cane, it just leaves them there and it won't pick them up. But when it, once it picks them up, it's just, instant almost from the time it picks it up till it places it neatly in the box. These are the boxes right here, unbroken. People are gone, machines are there. And you'll, you, know, you, you have to look here in the corner to find a person working in this factory, which is about two blocks long, uh, where we move boxes for either Amazon or Walmart. I'm not sure which one this is. Again, um, jobs are being destroyed, which we could have had uh, people working here, we now have mostly machinery, a lot of capital and no labor. Out with the old and in with the new. Things come and things go. My favorite economist of all times is this man, Joseph Schumpeter. I like to say he died the year that I was born, just before I was born. I would love to think that if I believed in re reincarnation, that this is, this is my old body and mind. But I flatter myself. Um, I do love what he talked about, and one of the main things Schumpeter talked about was creative destruction. Creative destruction is the essential fact about capitalism. It is what capitalism consists in and what every capitalist concern has got to live in. 
Schumpeter saw innovation as the essence of capitalism, and innovation creates new and improved, which automatically means old and obsolete, which automatically means churn. So that's what we call it. It's a shorthand for creative destruction, the churn. The churn is what makes us richer. Capitalism is a constant gale of creative destruction, and progress requires, requires that we destroy jobs. That's the paradox of progress. This is not the economy failing. This is, this, I can, you know, I plucked out just a few of these from the papers over the years. 17,000 jobs cut at GTE and, and so on. This is the economy succeeding, succeeding in shifting resources to new and better uses. People are our most valuable resource. And there's no way we can make progress down our list of needs and wants, food, clothing, shelter, and everything, unless we take those people from the existing industry and move them further down the list to other things we want. We have a long list of needs and wants, food, clothing, shelter, furniture, tools. For every one of those things, we need specific kinds of workers. We need seamstresses to make our clothing. We need steel workers to make some of our screwdrivers and stuff. We need drivers and pilots if we're going to have airplanes and, and uh, tr transportation of any kind. How are we going to get those when 95% of the population works on farms, which is what was the number was in 1790? Well, you only have 5% of the population left for all these other things. You're poor. So these jobs have to go away, and then the people from them move, be moved down here to to be doctors or nurses. Today, 1% of our population, 1.5% works on farms, yet fat has replaced starvation as our number one dietary concern. And we export food to the rest of the world. And we have released the other 94% of these people to go on and do uh, other things. With, with the four, we got 99% of the people now available to go f out of farming on d to other things that we care and value a lot, even Braces for our dogs, our psychics, uh, our list is never ending. We'll never wor have to worry about running out of um, things for people to do because we're never going to get down. You know, Bill Gates, I'm sure, could be pretty far down his list, but even find things that he would like to have. The proper role of a healthily functioning economy is to destroy jobs, of course, and then replace them with new and better ones. And that's what we've done. At one time, we worked in farms, and we moved people at first from the farm to the factory or to industrial jobs, manufacturing, mining, and construction. At its peak in 1953, about 35% of people worked in manufacturing. Today, we're, under, we're down to single digits, and about 9% of Americans work in factories. And it's not just technology that's taken there. It is also trade that has taken us there. As we've handed off some of those jobs, I call them it's like hand-me-down closing, hand-me-down industries to the rest of the world. And we move on to service jobs, which tend to be, on average, higher paying. Doctors, lawyers, dentists, accountants, engineers, computer program programmers, biological and life scientists, professors. There's a million professors in the economy and so on. Uh, and so about 82% of us today, if I take this to 2018, work in services jobs. Um, as, as, as the churn has been allowed to work, taking us from the agrarian age through the industrial age to the information age and beyond. Yes, this, uh, this economy, this capitalist economy, destroys jobs. We destroyed most of the jobs of the railroad employees. An asterisk here means less than 5,000 people now, now being black, blacksmiths down from 238,000 at its peak in 1910. All those things, switchboard operators gone, to farm workers gone, secretary jobs cut by a third, plastic, some of the people working in factories and specific jobs pretty much gone. Yes, we do destroy jobs, but we also create them. We've created jobs, over two million jobs for engineers up from the number we had in 1900, which was 38,000. Nobody was a medical technician in 1910, now they're two and a half million. We, got, we lost our Teamsters, which if you want to, know, want to know where the word Teamster came from, those were the people on the buckboard of the carriages of the uh, stagecoaches holding the team of horses. So we lost those Teamsters jobs, but got other jobs for truck, bus, and taxi drivers. 
electricians, professional athletes. You know where you're rich when you got so many professional athletes and so many different sports we now pay people to perform. Pharmacist jobs, especially a lot of computer programmers, and then workers in the construction industry. We have created millions and millions and millions of jobs over the time. Look, there's surely more destru job destruction on the way. And most of us realize this right, right now in the period of change that we're in, where artificial intelligence is coming in in many places and replacing human intelligence, connected to the Internet of Things, where soon my refrigerator will be talking to um, the grocery store and ordering things automatically, going and pick up by driverless cars and brought to me. I'll probably have to get out of the car and get out of my house and go get it out of the car. Um, but drones are here, new materials which are 100 and 200 times stronger than steel, superconductive light, um, and also things like, I mean, I keep going, but 3D printers. But this isn't even the big thing, the next big thing. None of these are the next big thing. This is the next big thing, CRISPR. Clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. I left off the R there. What is that? It's the stuff that you scientists make and they put in a little vial, which goes into your body, finds what's wrong with the genetic code, that, such as Alzheimer's, in your body, snips it out, replaces it with the correct code, and then you're done. You're fixed. And if you listen to the people who talk about this, I really urge you to go watch the 60 Minutes segment on this. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. And you will, sit, you will say, I can't be true. It is true, and it's happening already. And this is going to change life as we know it. Um, 6,000 different maladies, supposedly all of which can eventually be dealt with, bringing tremendous amount of change of course, investment opportunities, but lost jobs as well. And that's what people see. They see the lost jobs immediately. 667,000 surgeons and physicians and, and all, all the physicians' assistants, too, that go away. Or some of them, some portion of them uh, go away. No one really knows. And I get this question all the time. People come to me and they cite to me all the jobs that are going to be lost. And they say, but I don't see where the new jobs come from. I don't see where it's going to happen, and I'm worried. Let me tell you, if you go back and you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics bulletins of 1980, and you look for their projections of the number of computer programmers which are going to come into the economy, that even the supposedly some of the people who are studying this in the Department of Labor got it completely wrong. They, didn't, they had like a very few of these jobs coming into the economy compared to the 5 million we created. No one, no one really knows where the jobs will come from, but we do know from history that they'll be there. Because look at the, let's look at how the churn has operated to recycle American labor over time. Each one of these green lines is a period of economic expansion. Each one is a, this yellow is a period of economic contraction. So, and these numbers are in thousands, so that's 2.3 million jobs added in the two years when we had an expansion of 78, 79. Then we lost a couple million, then we gained 21 million, lost, gain, lost, gain, add it all up. During this time, there were 743 million claims for unemployment insurance, about, on average about 300,000 per month claims. People who lost their job thought they would be unemployed long enough to, need, to uh, need some money and made a claim. That's the total over this time period. Yet we have replaced all these jobs that were lost, the 743 million, and we added 60 million jobs new net. So the math comes out as it for every one million jobs lost in the economy, a million and eighty thousand were created, a million to replace the ones lost, then eighty thousand new ones, and we grow to by over this time period sixty million workers. Um, the economy is works. It works to recycle American labor to new, more important uses. There's a lot more green jobs gained monthly than there is red. Jobs lost. You see the jobs lost during the Great Recession um, there at the you know, more recent times. But despite, through all that, through all that change, through all that green and red, through all that uh, job loss and job gains, even when there's a lots of job gains going on, there are an initial claims for unemployment on a, on a weekly rate, which run, but, you know, averaging about 300,000 here. So we're recycling, recycling. To make American employment grow, by almost 100 million, 
over the longer time period from 1960 to, to today and to make the unemployment rate pretty much stay the same. It's now today about the lowest it's been in uh, 40, 50 years. So have no fear. I know that's hard, but have no fear because it's just a churn working. It's capitalism's paradox of progress. You stood up right at the right time, Bob. <laughs> Again, we've got time for a couple questions for Michael. Uh, usual deal with the microphones, if you please. Okay. So, Mike, uh, when you do those graphs, wouldn't it be at all helpful to have uh, per capita in there? Because, yeah, we're, we have a population influx and growth as well. So how, do the, how does the graph compare on a per capita basis? Uh Per capita, what? Jay, I'm not sure which one you're talking about. You know, it is, is we're at low unemployment record, right? Yeah. Not and record, that, but that has to do with per capita as well, right? It's percentage of the population. So, yeah, some, I, I don't, you can go back and do a lot of these. What am I do? Let me tell you one that I think is worth looking at in a, in a percentage basis that we normally don't. And that is the data on the initial claims for unemployment insurance. That's just a number, 300,000 people, right? And you can see it kind of goes up or down. It's really low right now. But if you, if you do that relative to the size of the labor force, and you say how many claims we're making for an economy of this size, what you see is it really is falling quite a bit because the labor force has grown so much. We keep, the, we keep the unemployment claims constant, but the labor force has grown. So as a ratio, it's really very small, the, the, the amount of uh, unemployment claims relative to the labor force. Yes, sir. Thank you for your presentation. Um, the question that I have is, based on how the market is flourishing now with the cut of regulations and things of that nature, but based on your presentation, so. We'll soon have driverless cars and, you know, you're talking about the truck, you know, driverless. Your microphone's not working, so I'm going to come over here. Can you hear me? Okay. So my question is, when you brought up the advancement of medicines such as CRISPR and things of that nature, so since I mentioned about the uh, deregulation of markets and, um, you know, jobs and the economy is flourishing in the same capacity, will we, same ha will we still have the same problem? So um, the medical industry, for example, I don't think it's regulated, so that should flourish. But when you talk about driverless cars and those industries, such oh, yeah. as transportation and everything, so even though we're talking about the losing of jobs, but also the advancement of the jobs, I guess what I'm saying is, will we still have the same, yep. will we still have the problem of unemployment at high levels or low levels? You know, because we're still going to have to deal with uh, regulation in uh, some of these markets. The government regulation. Yeah, this is something I think it's very, very important for people to understand, and I make sure my students understand this. Regulation. Rick and I wrote an article a few years ago, and it was intended as a, a tongue-in-cheek criticism of all the regulation that goes on out there. And the name of the article was that scientists discover breakthrough in instantaneous transport, where we have... Um, like, you know, the thing in the Star Trek where you can beam people from planet to planet. If you imagine what life is like on Earth at the time they're up there beaming people and from the Starship Enterprise to the Klingon planet, then you can bet it on the planet, too. There are also no cars, no parking lots, nobody's cracking oil to make it into gasoline. There are no um, you know, airline pilots, no airplanes, none of that. Just, we destroyed about 50 million jobs alone. Um, and so how do we get from there to there? Well, you can't get from here to the future if government steps in and, and um, receives the money of existing industry in their pocket as campaign contributions in order to stop progress, right? The existing people who, the status quo doesn't like change because they're, they're rich today and they don't want the future if in the future, uh, you know, they're, they're the uh, telephone yellow pages and they're about to be wiped out. So they tend to run to Congress and places and ask for their entrenched interest to be protected. In this article, we said that, we said that, uh, sign, that somebody asked for a moratorium on the testing of these 
of these uh, transporters, right? Who asked for the moratorium? The existing big business. And that is the problem. And if it were left up to the existing industries, the status quo, and what they can do through government to protect their entrenched interests, you would never see the future. You'd never have cars if the carriage industry, you know, you'd ne there's a letter from, about uh, stopping the railroads from President An to President Andrew Jackson from the canal industry up in uh, New York. So, One more question in the back, problem. back here. Uh, yes, you've talked a lot about employment in the marketplace. What about those employees who don't apply for uh, unemployment insurance that are falling into what is now being termed the gig economy or what we would officially term as 1099 uh, employees or employees who are being paid uh, in other ways. Uh, what, what impact does that have on the economy? Do you see that increasing? And is that something that uh, is going to need to be tracked more closely in the future? It doesn't seem to be increasing. I mean, thanks to, you know, First of all, those people, many times what happens is that you need to get re-educated, right? You need to learn new skills, and uh, you can go back to school, you can go, there's so many opportunities now to get educated outside of schools uh, with all kinds of uh, community college programs or even on the internet, teach yourself. You know, there's, people are very, very resilient if they have to be. And if they don't have to be, they aren't. And that's the problem with unemployment insurance. You know, my, like I said, my favorite economist, Joseph Schumpeter, has a quote that says, the real tragedy um, of unemployment is not the unemployment itself, but the impossibility of providing adequately for the employed without damaging the economic system, without keeping them from becoming permanently dependent, and so on. So, I, you know, it, my feeling about human nature is that when people, you know, have to suck it up and get tough and learn and so on, they will do it. But I'm, I fear that the government's programs and so on will rob them of that, really rob them of their dignity to get reemployed productively. Thank you.